it's been really crazy lately, hasn't it? It has been just really, really crazy in, in our world. Uh, first, there was uh, the Cubs winning the World Series, and then there was the election that took place this week, and so it's no wonder that in the midst of all this craziness, a lot of people are talking about the end of the world. Is this the end of the world as we know it? People are literally thinking a lot about the end of the world. And so I think it's very fitting for today that here we're at the end of the church year, the second to last Sunday in the church year, for the Advent season that's coming up in two weeks starts a new church year for us. But the focus of our readings is upon the end of all things, when Christ will come again in glory at the last day. And what I notice when we oftentimes talk about the end of all things, we get all panicky don't we? We get all scared and we wonder, is this a sign? Is, is that a sign? Is this the Antichrist? What does this mean? What does that mean? And we as the Christian church end up acting like the unbelieving world. We get all panicky. And instead, we need to hear what Jesus said today in Luke chapter 21 and what we'll hear from Malachi as well, that the day of Christ's return is certainly a day that brings terror, but only for the unbelievers. But for those who have their hope in Christ, for those who are trusting in Christ, Jesus says, don't worry. Not even a, a hair of your head will be harmed. Don't worry. I've got, this. I've got this under control. Don't worry. All your days and all your time and all the world and all the universe is in my hand. He's got it all in his hand. He remains the most powerful person in the world, the most powerful person in the universe, and we can trust in him. And so in a world that seems constantly in disarray and seems so unstable, we can take solace in the fact that the Lord God is seated on high and through His Word He brings, he brings the confidence that we have in trusting Him and knowing that He is God and we are His children. And so today I'd like to share with you some thoughts about our, our Old Testament lesson from Malachi chapter 4. In Malachi chapter 4, it's the final chapter of the Old Testament. And the prophet Malachi is the last writing prophet of the Old Testament. And he's writing 430 years before the birth of Jesus. And so after Malachi is done with his writing and his prophesying, there is a long silent period called the intertestamental period. People still were trusting in the Lord. People still were clinging to what God had given in His Word. And yet there weren't any prophets going out and preaching and writing. People were waiting. They were waiting for the coming of the Lord. And so 430 years after Malachi wrote, Jesus was born. And people who had been waiting for generations finally had the Lord in their midst. And I think that that parallels with us today, that we're waiting for the Lord. We're waiting for the Lord who came once to come a second time. And this time, not to come in humility to suffer for our sin, but to come in great power and glory and to triumph over our sin. Not to come as a humble carpenter in Nazareth, but to come as the King of the universe who is reigning and ruling forever. Jesus Christ is coming and Malachi speaks of the coming of the Lord. But as he speaks of the coming of the Lord, he speaks of that coming of the Lord in, in two distinct ways. And so think about the prophets as they're speaking about the Lord's going to come. They can speak about two things at the same time. The first coming of the Lord that they're referring to is the coming of Jesus the Savior to heal and to restore. To heal and to restore people to God through the forgiveness of sins. And so they're, they're announcing that Jesus will break into human history. That as it says in Galatians, when the time would fully come, God would send forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law to, to buy us back from the curse of the law. That Jesus would come when the time was right and He would live and He would suffer, He would die and He would rise to give us life so that when we would trust in Him, we would be restored to the Father. We would have healing that comes through the forgiveness of our sins. That's what we know right now, that Jesus has come once. And yet the prophets also speak of His final coming. The second vantage point that they have is the coming of the Savior on the final day, the last day, that Jesus says we're not to worry about. But in that day known only to God, Jesus will come. And what He will do is He will reign and He will rule 
through the establishment of an everlasting kingdom. So Jesus will show all of the world that He is God, that He has been large and in charge through it all. And He's got the whole world, and you and me, brother, and you and me, sister, in His hands. He is coming again. And so in many ways, when Malachi is writing and looking at these two comings of Jesus, it's like standing on top of a mountain peak. Imagine if you've ever done this before. Have you ever gone hiking or or mountain climbing? And you get to the top of the mountain, and you feel like this guy that's on the screen now. You feel like a person that's standing on top of a mountain, and you're looking out at this vast array of God's creation. And if you've ever been able to stand high upon a precipice of a mountain peak and you look out in the far distance, you see far away, miles upon miles away, and you might be able to see the mountains. But then closer in, you still see the mountains, right? So you can be at the same time looking at those ranges that are closer to you while also looking at those beautiful ranges that are further away from you. And so it is with reading the prophets in the Bible. They can be talking about both of those things at the same time. That which is closer to them, that is the first coming of Jesus, to restore and to heal through the forgiveness of sins. And then that what is further away in His final coming when He will rule and He will reign through the establishment of His kingdom that knows no end. And so they are talking about both His first coming and His final coming. As people who know that He came once, we have confidence that He will come again. And yet in Malachi's time, they were still looking forward to both of those comings. And yet they lived with hope and confidence that God would remain faithful to His Word. And so Malachi chapter 4, verse 1 goes like this. He says, Surely the day is coming, and the day will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set all of that on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. So the day that the prophet is having in view here is the last day, the day of the final judgment when that judgment of Almighty God will take place. It says that that day will be like a a furnace fire, but who will be affected by the fire of the furnace? It says it's the arrogant and the evildoer. The arrogant is described as the one who has no need for God. They don't need God to reign in their lives. They want to be their own lowercase g God. They want to be over all things. The evildoer, one who has never given their sins to Jesus, one who dies in their sins, one who is comfortable in their sins, and they do what is wrong. That is, they reject Jesus Christ. On that day of final judgment, like the burning fire of a furnace, Jesus will destroy. He will destroy sin, and He will destroy death. So the only things that need to fear that day are sin and death and those who have been enveloped by them. Those who have rejected Christ will be sentenced to the fire, as the Bible describes it, of eternal separation from God. Those who have wanted God to be out of their lives Those who have had no need for Jesus, those who have said no to Him time and time again, God will finally on the last day remove His presence from them. They will be separated from Him. And the the biblical description of that is is the fire of a, a furnace. We don't want that for anyone. And it actually tells us in the Bible that God's desire is not that people perish, but that they repent and that they live. But this is the fate of those who have in their own free will rejected Jesus Christ. So the fear that comes from the furnace is not for you and for me if we're receiving Jesus. It's only for those who have rejected Him. And here comes the but, B-U-T, but for you who have revered my name, Malachi 4 verse 2. So I pray this describes all of us. For those who have honored God's name, revered His name, those who fear and love and trust in Him, those who have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, those who look upon the cross and say, Jesus died for me, and those who look at the empty tomb and say, Jesus lives for me so I can live for Him. But for those who revere My name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. And you will go out and you will frolic like a well-fed calves. And you will trample on the wicked 
and they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. So do you see the great contrast here? In contrast to a burning fire of judgment that awaits those who have rejected Christ, those who trust in Christ will be warmed by the healing message of God's righteousness, by the gospel of Jesus. It will warm you. It describes God as a son of righteousness. And that son has rays which can be also translated as wings. The picture on the screen before you is an example from ancient Mesopotamian culture of a sun disk with wings. That in the ancient times, many cultures, including the Jewish culture of Israel, would picture the sun with the rays of of uh, of, of the sun being like wings that would spread out and would be able to envelop people in them. And so it is with the description of the Lord, that the Lord is like the sun that gives righteousness, that makes you right with God. And the rays of the sun coming down are like wings that come to gather you into the Lord's presence. Jesus himself described it one time in Luke chapter 13. He, he looked over the city of Jerusalem and he said, Jerusalem, How I've longed to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. That's how God looks at you when you trust in Him. As a father who comes down and with the the rays or with the wings of His presence, He envelops you and brings you close to Himself. Picture yourself on a warm beach. Wouldn't that be nice this morning? (laughs) Picture yourself on the beach and and you're sitting there and the sun is shining and you know how it goes when the rays of the sun are shining and it gives you the feeling of comfort it in it it, it envelops you it embraces you it's like the the wings of the sun come down to envelop you and you're sitting there and and you're probably wearing sunglasses and for me you're wearing your spf 50 and you're you're laying out and maybe there is a beverage in, in your hand and and the waves are lapping upon the shore, and there's an umbrella. And someone said to me, well, that umbrella is only there because you're a redhead. So if the umbrella isn't over you, maybe the umbrella is in your beverage. But you're sitting there on the beach, and the sun is shining. And what does that sun do? That sun comforts you. That sun warms you. That sun reminds you that you can find peace. That in a world where there will be tribulation and trouble, Jesus says, take heart, I've overcome the world, and in me you will have peace. The sun of righteousness shines, and like that sun disk of ancient times, it reaches down through its rays and it envelops you in its wings. Psalm 91 describes the same about your God. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. Do you need that promise today? That's God's promise for you that in the midst of your struggle that He is there to cover you with His wings, to cover you with His rays so that in His faithfulness you can be shielded from all of the wickedness of this world. Malachi speaks that way of God so that you would know Him, that He who is coming will do that for you as you trust in Him. He will draw you into His presence. And so Malachi, to wrap up his prophecy, says, now remember... He's going to point back to all that has taken place in the Old Testament. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws that I gave him at Horeb for all of Israel. Remember the Ten Commandments? Shall have no other gods before me, shall not misuse my name. You shall remember the Sabbath day, and on and on and on. Remember the Ten Commandments? Malachi, the final writing prophet, says that the law of God is important. It's not abolished, but it stands fulfilled. The law of God that commands good works and demands our obedience is fulfilled in the coming of Jesus. That 430 years later, there would be one who would come and he would actually obey the law of God completely. And who would he do that for? He would do it for you. That only he who obeyed his Father perfectly can be able to transfer that obedience to you and to me by faith. 
So Jesus' coming, remember? The first coming, He came to live under the law, to live a perfect life, so that at His final coming, what will He do? He will take His right standing before God and He will give it to you as one who has trusted in Him so that He can welcome you into the kingdom of heaven so that your standing in the presence of the Father is the same as Jesus' standing that you are welcomed into His presence because you have been clothed in Christ and you've been covered in the rays of the Son of Righteousness. You remember the law, but also remember the prophets. Says Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. In the Gospels, Jesus describes John the Baptist as that Elijah the one who came as the final prophet of the Old Testament era and who prepared the way for Christ to come. John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. And he will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents. Or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Period. End of quote. End of Old Testament. So what is Malachi doing? He's reminding us that all of the prophets of God who called people to repent and to believe, to turn away from sin and turn towards the Lord, that all of those prophets will find their fulfillment in Christ, that He will come onto the scene. And when He comes, He will reveal Himself as the capital P prophet, the ultimate spokesperson for Almighty God. And His coming once guarantees His coming a second time. Once to suffer for sin, another time to completely abolish it. And did you notice what that final verse of the Old Testament called for? For hearts of parents to turn towards their kids and hearts of kids to turn toward their parents. That the final verse of the Old Testament would call for families to turn toward one another and to turn together toward the Lord who alone gives healing and salvation. That God wants us to live life today and let tomorrow be His to worry about. And maybe you would ask yourself, what would I do today? What would I do right now if I knew for a fact that Jesus was coming back tomorrow? Martin Luther was once asked that question, what would you do today if you knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow and the world would be over? And Luther said, if I knew that, I'd, I'd plant a tree. I'd plant a tree. In other words, I would simply do today what God has put before me today. Whatever that is. Whatever my calling is. Whatever He has asked me to be faithful in. And I would leave tomorrow to Him. And I would not get so caught up in worrying about the end of all things, but I would focus upon my calling right now to love God and to love my neighbor, to love my family, to share Christ in my words and actions and look forward to the day when He breaks into the scene and He makes me new in His eternal kingdom. So friends, Malachi. Malachi says the day is coming. And how should we prepare for that day? We should look forward and hope. We should leap like a well-fed calf. And we should be excited, not panicky, but excited that for those who revere the name of the Lord, the Son of Righteousness will reach down. And with the rays of the sun will give you and me the healing that we so desperately need and will envelop us into the presence of the Lord.